this is this is one of those features that I kind of worried about. The other thing I thought about, you know, some businesses do want to convert my IP addresses to identities and actually have people logged in with a password. Uh, for example, what about the uh, copyright cartel and their aspiration to, to, you know, to say what an IP address is a person? Well, I, I mean, I, I think in closing we can second guess what the ultimate direction of Google Plus will be. At present, I think the service is fantastic merely because it fits into a little gap between when I have something more to say than a single line in, in Identica or not or something which isn't um, substantial enough to fit into a blog post in its own right then Google Plus fits in very nicely and I can do a, a couple of lines or a couple of paragraphs with my thoughts for the day and I, I, th I think it fits in the gap now if, Go if the result of that is Google is building up a profile on the subjects I'm interested in fine for me personally I'd make a point of not buying into anything that's offered to me without my consent online, whether it's by an ad, by an email or whatever. And I think a lot of people are the same. I've always wondered how effective these uh, advertising campaigns are because from my experience and all the experience the, the, of the many people... Sp the spammy email ones is 1 in 27 million. Mm. The ones that Roy's talking about where they put an ad that looks like it's from a close trusted friend even though it's not, but they're using your social graph to determine it. Uh, on unsophisticated users, they're about 50-50 successful, which is why they're becoming more and more popular. Like if it, if it knows you're in Houston, Texas, and you go to Social Site X, you will see everybody you know within a 50-mile radius of Houston, Texas in your social graph, like recommending this thing. And that's like going to the Y, or I guess the community center, I don't know what the equivalent would be in the UK, and having Where's all your the friends go. as well here. Yeah, okay. yeah, okay. And they all tell you, you know, you got to try this thing. It, it's like that, and you think it's them if you're an unsophisticated user. You don't know it's computer-generated. Well, I, I, th I think just to, to end the, the Google Plus discussion, I, I would say this. Um, a few curiosos here from um, my use of it over the last few weeks. I think out of all, all three of us, I've used probably used it the most. Rusty, have you made a post on uh, Google Plus yet? I, I made a few. Um, I, I was actually going to start using it like you do, and I was going to tie it into the show that sucks over here until mm. Tiny over here tried to go to Google Plus because I set up a, a G Plus .to, and when he goes to it on his Android phone, it redirects to the .m version of Google, you know, the m.google version, the mobile version, yep. and because it's not publicly accessible right now, it locks them out of everything, including the public posts. Yeah. Well, talking of which, um, this is one uh, area of a bit of confusion for me, because you're probably going to gasp at this, but I find it a very useful feature. On the Android app for Google+, Plus, there's a very useful feature which shows you the nearby or people nearby to you who are making posts on a, on Google Plus. I don't think we've decided on a generic term yet for making a post in Google Plus. Um, but in in absence of that, for anybody who's local to you at the time, um, obviously it tracks you via your. Um, I think I think it does it by your IP address. I believe it's not very sophisticated, but it's a very useful feature for me, and it's not, not present on the web-based app at the moment. I, I, I think on the phone it's doing it by more than the IP address if you're posting from your phone. But as far as for everything else, yeah, it's doing mm. it by IP. I recognize the well, Google wants your own MAC address well, as well. Well, the, the reason why I say it's by the IP is because when I've no, looked at it recently, some of the people that it claims are nearby are very, very far away from me. Um, but the IP is your yeah I, yeah, I, I so, I've seen that a lot too. It is doing the IP geo coordinates right now, which can be as much as an hour away. <laughs> yeah, I mean in some cases it was it was something like fifty miles I think was the, the furthest away, and uh, I've seen from the location when the when it posts my location on uh, Diaspora etc. That's it's never very accurate. I think the closest I've ever been is about a mile from my actual address. So, but that in mind, it's, it's still very useful and uh, and very relevant. It is quite interesting to see who else is a, a Linux uh, user or uh, interested in the same topics as me who lives just around the corner or certainly within uh, driving distance. So now that can get better if people are willing to trust Google Plus mm -hmm. with their actual address. Like if they go in their profile and go, "I'm at the corner of blah blah and so and so," you know. Mm -hmm. But most people aren't doing that yet. <laughs>
Uh, and also, I don't believe it has hashtags yet. Um, Diaspora is um, fully utilizing hashtags in very much the same way that Twitter and Identica do. Maybe uh, Google can do search very well, so they will omit all the unnecessary words and pick up the keywords. Well, not really. It has the Sparks, which searches sites, um, which I think is a bit of a naff feature. Google Sparks, where you can enter your, your words of interest, for example. And, and, and it doesn't really work well. No. Basically, unless it's a sponsored spark, you're but not going to find anything. Here's but one that, uh, well, here's one that Roy will, I think, uh, have a little wry smile about on, on his end of the line today. And that's um, when it, one of my sparks on Google Plus is FOSS. And uh, I think the top three, um, one of which is the site FOSS patents, is uh, listed every uh, every time I click on my spark. So... Uh, <laughs> the MPS, yeah. <laughs> yes. And um, funny enough, Roy, though, um, from what you were seeing, I, I know you've been very outspoken about FOSS patents. Um, it doesn't seem to have gone unnoticed, your opinions, by other people on Google Plus and um, Fab from the Linux Outlaws, uh, I believe, made a very similar um, comment very recently on Google Plus um, in regards to uh, Florian Muller. I, th- I hope that's his uh, proper name. That's how you pronounce his name. Um, so it, it, was quite, it was quite bizarre to see comments that you said maybe, I think, over a year ago to me, um, echoed within Google Plus just recently. So, uh, yes, but, uh, sorry, moving on. Uh, Rusty, I interrupted you there. Uh, that's okay. Um, it, it, I, I, I mean, to rehash, you know, like what you were saying, I given you want to see the worst thing, go look at Commodore's profile. I mean, he's just made up everything, and they obviously don't care. Hopefully it stays that way. And then again, that's it. I, Hopefully, whoever at Google is making the decisions between whether to yank these names or not is able to understand when people are using their online pseudonym. Because if you have an online persona that you've been using for years, that's really what you want your Google Plus to be, not your legal name or anything even resembling a nickname. Because... People won't be able to find you. Well, they didn't. They didn't like mine, um, so I had to think of a surname. Um, and as I said at the time, it's up to Google Plus now to prove or disprove that it's my real surname. But uh, it was a shame because. If, well, what um, you can do if you really want to use it like that is go to gplus.to, mm. and and then you can have like gplus.to slash whatever. The only thing I don't like about that is you're only allowed one pseudo thing per Google ID. So you like you can't make a mistake and you can't have more than one name. You have to create a whole other Google ID to have another name. Well, we'll move on from Google Plus now um, on to our next topic for tonight. And I'm not sure how much Roy or um, Rusty has been following this because this is more a subject close to a close to my own heart and what I'm certainly very interested in and that's a date for everybody's diaries the 12th of January I believe next year and that's going to be the date that um, Andrew Crosley finally goes in front of the solicitors uh, disciplinary tribunal about the actions regarding speculative invoicing and I use that word very loosely uh, for the copyright infringements alleged that uh, people that were using file sharing networks to uh, share material so that's quite a, an interesting set of events because there's also been questions asked as to whether other companies which pulled out before the uh, proverbial hit the fan for want of a better phrase and uh, TBI solicitors has been mentioned as one of the one of the firms that uh, is questioned about whether it's going to have any involvement in this uh, disciplinary tribunal and also um, uh, and the, the name's now on Davenport and Lyons it was on the tip of my tongue um, so that's coming up on the 12th of January. There's going to be a lot of very interesting people in that. And I remember this time last year, it was a very different discussion. And we were having uh, a lot of people who were very frightened by letters that they received through the post for alleging uh, that they were sharing copyrighted files. And there was talk of taking them to court and rather large fines unless they settled early. And so it's very interesting to see in the space of a year how things have changed so radically. And that's been in no small part due to the release, I believe, of the uh, leaked emails from ACS Law. So I hope that's one that Rusty, because I know Roy hasn't been following this too uh, in too much depth. But Rusty, I don't know if you have any uh, any knowledge of the ACS Law case. No, I really don't. It's um, I haven't been following it that closely, so I. Uh, other than what you were saying, I can't really contribute on and it. I, I've got, I've got beg your pardon, actually. What's the uh, dispute about the fact that they were sending letters to people based on their IP addresses? Was it the actual practice of trying to invoice people's specu? 
It was. It's. I, I believe it's a double pronged attack. I haven't got the list of complaints against Andrew Crosley directly, but uh, I think the I think the two main points were was that yes, as you say, Roy, the the weight of or the strength of evidence when it's based merely on an IP address is rather weak. Well, Google can help now. Yeah. <laughs> what, what I know about this, but I see I'd be going by U.S. law, not U.K. law, which are different mindsets. It it sounded to me when I heard about it that it was the equivalent of what copyright and. Tr-